This episode of the Outdoor Life Podcast is brought to you by Brownells. Our test of the best new rifles and handguns is the single biggest project that we do at Outdoor Life each year. During a full week at Gunsight Academy in Arizona, we shoot thousands and thousands of rounds through the most interesting new firearms to hit the market. And amid all of this range testing, trends and revelations begin to emerge. We gain insight not just on individual guns, but we also get some hints about where the firearms industry is headed. I'm Editor-in-Chief Alex Robinson, and for the next two Outdoor Life podcasts, we're bringing you interviews straight from the gun test. In this episode, I'm talking to our shooting editor, John Snow, staff writer, Tyler Friel, and industry veteran and gun team member, Matt Foster. And here, we'll be talking about a resurgence in lever action rifles. All right, so we are here in the desert at Gunsight in the middle of the rifle portion of our 2024 gun test, which, you know, if you listen to this podcast, you know, this is like our biggest test of the year. We get in all the new rifles and handguns to shoot for over the course of a week. And you, Jon Snow, want to talk about lever guns. Have you gone full FUD on us? Like, what is this? Okay, well, for for one, I have never not been a lever gun guy you know i you know kind of cut my teeth hunting deer in the northeast and in and in michigan and you know back in the day not that long ago lever guns uh ruled the roost and so you know my first big game rifle was a marlin 336 and 35 remington and uh, you know i've just been in love with the platform for the same reason that so many of us are you know, in terms of the nostalgia, the imagery with the West and Cowboys and just, and they're flat out effective and super fun to shoot. So that said, you know, it wasn't that long ago, I'd say, you know, maybe 15, 20 years ago that not that the lever gun platform seemed like it was on its last legs, but it definitely was kind of just sort of a musty old sort of yesterday's news kind of deal. And that's not the case at all. Yeah. Yeah. Tyler, would you call this a lever gun comeback, what we're seeing this year? Which we'll get into the details, but what do you think about the field and just what you've seen in the last couple of years in terms of lever action rifles? I don't know. I guess some people would probably call it a comeback. I don't know if I, if they ever really went away, but certainly a little bit of a resurgence, like in some new, you know, kind of revived interest that maybe wasn't there, you know, when, when Marlin kind of teetered and went away basically with the bankruptcy of Remington kind of just weren't there anymore you know Marlins and that was really for common lever guns that's what there was you yeah. know so I mean I would I would say maybe a little bit of a comeback that would be accurate to say you're seeing a lot of uh ingenuity yeah you're not you know creating new things really but there's a lot a lot of variety and manufacturers that are making stuff coming out with stuff that you you know i didn't expect to see so it's it's cool i mean i think there's reviving a lot of the a lot of the stuff that has uh kind of been forgotten i mean the 4570 which spent a lot of years as being basically non-existent yeah you know yeah antiquated and was brought back and is probably more popular now than it ever was if i had to guess yeah before we get into the new guns, the new lever action rifles, and kind of the the comeback that you're talking about. Let's go to the dark times a little bit. Uh, <laughs> and Matt, I don't want to put you on the spot. Well, actually, I do want to put you on the spot. Oh, good. That's, that'll be fun. Will you tell us your Marlin SBL story? Uh, I will, but but first, um, you know, I think I want to add to the to the the comeback and you know the the part of the dark times for Marlin and. You know, I think I think as much as a comeback, and it certainly has been a comeback with Marlin from guns that weren't doing so great under Remington's ownership to them just going away for a while. So certainly that constitutes a comeback. But there's also been a resurgence with a lot of new shooters that weren't previously into lever actions and really I don't think ever had been exposed to lever guns. But with some of the newer guns that have been introduced, it's really appealed to them. So as much as a resurgence, I think it's actually – really seen a dramatic expansion of the market for lever action rifles. And 
I think you've seen that now with, uh, you know, Smith and Wesson introduced the liver gun, which I might be, you know, jumping ahead here, but who thought that was going to happen. And then you've seen some of the introduction of lever guns based on, you know, AR platforms for gosh sake. So I think there's an incredible expansion of, you know, the, the shooters that want the, the fun and versatility of lever action rifle. So. Okay. Quit dancing around it. Take us to the, take us to the SBL story we've all been waiting for. <laughs> you're like, you're like the father of the SBL. Yes. The, uh, the father of the SBL. So uh, when I was at Marlin, I was director of marketing at Marlin just before Remington's acquisition. And so one of my first Marlins, I actually bought a guide gun before I even thought about, even, even thought about working at Marlin. So had always loved the platform, had always loved the gun. But one of the things when I got, when I became director of marketing at Marlin was you get information from consumers and dealers and everything else. And, you know, really there were just some attributes to the, to the lever gun or the, you know, the guide gun that people consistently ask for. So you know, it seemed pretty easy that, you know, people wanted a full length mag tube. They wanted the pistol grip stock instead of the, the straight grip and, you know, wanted uh, the, the black and gray laminate. We didn't have it in the line though. So I thought, well, let's go ahead and make one. Well, I, <laughs> I, uh, you know, sort of put together, specked out what this gun should be and went to the other executives and, you know, sort of made the case and, I mean, I wasn't laughed out of the room, but it was, you know, basically told that no one will pay that much money for a Marlin. Uh, nobody wants that. And yeah, pretty much, you know, forget about it, go away and, you know, don't ever, you know, we can't wait to never speak about this again. Get back in your hole. <laughs> yeah, get, <laughs> yeah, get back, get back in your hole and, you know, go, uh, you know, go book some ads or something and, you know, get out of our hair. Now, now not to, you know, give this, giving this little context. I think part of the dynamic at the time was, you know, when I was growing up and coming of age and Matt, you're in the same thing, you know, the, the cheapest gun you could find cheapest deer gun was a 94 or 336. You know, those were typically like the entry level gun. So you had that kind of expectation, cultural expectation of the price point pressure. That said, it's not like the souped up lever gun came out of nowhere. There was definitely a very active subculture, which you were aware of. So whether it was through Brockman mm-hmm. or Grizzly um, Guns or, or, Gun Wild or West. Jim West, yeah, and that so, was so there was the so there were these two camp that that other camp was already extant, and you know you wanted to lead the powers that be down that road, yeah, yeah, Marlin. That that's a good point, Marlin. Really, other than the the only expensive guns Marlin had were the were the really nice or fancy ones, you know, the mm-hmm. really ornate cowboy yeah. guns or something like that. Like a commemorative sort of. Absolutely. Yeah. They were not thinking about lever guns as a high performance platform. Actually, I mean, to Marlon's credit though, they, their introduction of the guide gun, you know, that was a, that was a brilliant move. And that actually, you know, really to a certain extent kind of started get, getting some of those high performance shooters for, for the people that wanted to, the 4570 smash mouth in your face. It was a short barrel compared to what Marlin made for everything. You had a little 18 and a half inch barrel. So, but then they just kind of didn't do anything with it after that. Right. Just, okay, we got the guy again. We're done. That's our, that's our performance, you know, performance machine. So as a matter of fact, I had referenced these three other gun makers as, as an indication that the market for those guns was in fact there. I, I literally said that these guys or companies are making a living off of taking our gun doing all these modifications to it and the customer has to provide the gun and they were still charging almost a thousand dollars for it. So, but again, you know, they were used to three thirty sixes sold at Walmart and so forth and just couldn't fathom it. The only thing we had that was sort of performance oriented was the XLR. And I'm not sure if you remember that gun, but it was a long barreled lever action to, and it was, it coincided with Hornady's introduction of lever evolution, which was actually Part of the comeback of lever actions got a lot of notoriety, a lot of attention, definitely extended the range a little bit. Didn't turn into a long range rifle by any means. I mean, not even close, but it was fun. It made a big difference. Well, I looked at that and thought, well, look at that. That XLR is basically about halfway to being the gun that I want. So, so after the meeting, uh, I requisitioned out an XLR. And the XLR had the gray laminate stocks, had a regular lever loop, had to figure that out. But it was made of stainless steel, which is what I wanted, and had a long barrel. So I thought, well, it's easier to shorten something than lengthen a barrel. So requisitioned this out, and I took it to R&D. 
and they uh, they had heard about the meeting and weren't necessarily thrilled when I walked in with this you know with this gun because they knew exactly what I wanted them to do. <laughs> so we in fact uh, cut the barrel and took a cowboy action uh, mag two, which is think like you know twenty four inches long or something, and cut that down. Had to send it out to electroless nickel because we didn't have any stainless steel mag tubes that were long. So I had electroless nickels. So that was one thing about the prototype. The mag tube wasn't stainless steel. Got a large lever loop and called my buddy Dave Biggers at XS Sites. And he sent the rail and the site and the front site and basically put this thing together. Well, at the time, I was uh, pretty active on MarlinOwners.com, which is still present. It's a great, great website for Marlin owners, uh, you know, forum and you know, groups and so forth. And I'd promised them pictures of a new prototype guide gun if I was able to get this thing made. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I took a couple pictures in my office. I still have those original pictures. Did a little uh, rough Photoshop job just to give it a white background. And, you know, I got the post ready. So, hey, guys, as promised, here's the, you know, here's the prototype guide gun. Let me know what you think. And so I sat there and contemplated for a moment. I wrote the post. And I said, my you know, finger hovering over the, uh, you know, enter key. I thought, yeah, why not? Go ahead and pull the pin out of the grenade, see what happens. So went ahead and hit enter. I don't think it was probably more than, I don't know, 15, 20, 30 minutes and my phone rang. And it was, and it was, it was, it was Bob the president. He wanted me to come see him. And I thought, oh, I, I probably have an idea what that's about. So you're like, I'm getting a promotion. Yeah, I'm getting a promotion. <laughs> uh, well, fortunately he didn't say, you know, can you come to my office and, and please bring everything in, in your desk with you? So, you know, I figured I wasn't too, too bad a shape, but uh, so I did go in and of course he basically asked me what I had done. And I said, well, I, I, I don't know. I just, and he's like, yeah. Um, he goes, that, that's not good. <laughs> so apparently as soon as that thing hit the, the forum, uh, switchboard started lighting up. Dealers were calling in and asking where they could get it. And consumers wanted to know where they could get it and how much. And I'd have to go back and look, but I think that particular thread on marlinowners.com has the most like subsequent pages of, you know, any, any post, or at least certainly way up. There's like up to 35 pages of, you know, responses. It to went this viral. Thing. It went viral. Yeah. back It went viral. <laughs> this is before social media. So yeah. Um, yeah. So I'll be, I'll, you know, so I'm almost 65 retiring soon, but uh, yeah. So that's, I mean, that's basically it. Um, they still, there was resistance with Remington to, to making the gun a little bit, but, yeah, I mean, they kind of knew they had to. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's just no yeah. way they were going to get out of that one. Um, so there's one thing that's interesting about the SBL is there's there's a fortuitous mistake on the prototype that made it in production. So when I specced out, specced out the gun, I wanted a full-length mag tube. I wanted that combat shotgun look. I mean, that mag tube ran right to the front. Because nobody was really using suppressors back then. And there mm. certainly weren't suppressors readily available for the 4570. So that wasn't even on the radar screen. I wanted the full-length mag tube. Well, when they were making it, the way they cut the dovetail for hanging the mag tube and putting the excess side on and so forth, they basically left that little nub of a barrel sticking out. And that made it into production. And how lucky is that that all Ruger had to do was just thread it. Yeah, that is a good story. And I'm glad that we you got to finally tell it to us. Um, <laughs> th- it's also a really good segue to the guns that we're dealing with now, because like that energy and um, like the interest in you know kind of adapting this platform for all these different things. Like I think that's a lot of what we're seeing in the you know the modern lever gun market. So maybe just like run us through some of the more interesting lever guns that we have in this test and you know, kind of use them to tell the story of like how the lever gun is kind of growing in these different directions for these different purposes. Yeah. Um, well, you know, Marlin, since, since the SBL introduction and, you know, through kind of their ups and downs has, you know, put a lot of energy into kind of making like kind of cool kid um, lever guns. And we have a great example of that in the Marlin dark yeah, that we have now, which is, um, you know, you you always kind of wonder when people start kind of accessorizing guns in different ways. Like, is it going to hang together? Is it going to kind of work? Is it going to flow? You know, le- lever guns in particular are incredibly complicated pieces of equipment in terms of timing and everything else. So it's it's not difficult to 
make one go wonky in in by by tweaks that you might not think would actually have an impact you know it's it's a sensitive platform in that in that regard but anyway this marlin dark has this really cool you know foreign on it that has a m lock compatible it's kind of all blacked out and it's chambered in 4570 and you know it sort of has a much more kind of tactical focus and look it's got a, a, a stock on it that's kind of hollowed out in the back, sort of minimalistic, kind of like the old Ruger, um, you know, seventy uh, sevens um, that had. Yeah, those. a little bit. The, it's got the, the, the cutie the, the, sling the boat paddles. Yeah, the bit. cutie sling cups. Well, one thing that like this Marlin Dark, like a lot of their other, well, which started when under Ruger's ownership with the SBL was the first. It's you know they they're revamping these different lines one by one and the Remington under Remington they had a dark series had a dark I don't know that it ever went deal. very far but but this you know and this one is just like well a and, the, and the best stock is polymer yeah which is which is a first for Marlin for for the lever actions yeah um, yeah because the old the old darks were wood okay still. Yeah. were wood oh. they were Cerakoted, Um and they had a number of models I mean I'll, you know give credit where credit is due even though Remington had a difficult time producing the guns I mean that's that's probably being generous or an understatement you know in in the latter years before you know Remington you know did what Remington does they were producing some really you know really attractive looking Marlin darks they had some were Cerakoted, some tan some that were you know all blacked out they really did a nice job with it the the gentleman who was at Remington at the time that was basically, you know, growing that line. Fortunately, he was at Ruger. He was one of the stand at the good standouts during that time at Remington for Marlin. And so it was really nice to see that they, you know, brought him over for that. Yeah. So we've got, so we've got that, that dark series kind of, um, you know, is, is one expression of this sort of tactical lever gun. Um, then we've got another kind of like really solid, an interesting entry from Smith and Wesson, you know, the 1854. And again, I don't think any of us had a Smith and Wesson lever action on our bingo card for 2024, you know, and for me, the thing that's remarkable about it is that there's nothing um, hinky or weird about the gun. It's hard to make a new gun under the best of circumstances. And a lever gun is, like I said, particularly complicated and they have this thing really nicely kind of configured, um, you know, for general hunting use. They have it in two trims. We have the kind of the rough and ready, less expensive one. They've got a nicer kind of woodstock version that's sort of a high grade. But, you know, for kind of our purposes and our audience, this is chambered in 44 mag, takes 44 special as well, loads from a side gate, can load from the top of the magazine tube, at least when you don't have a suppressor on it. It's threaded, it's it's durable, um, you know, and that's been running well. So that's like a good kind of big woods hunting rig, you know. I mean, so we've we've got the you know the heavier hitting forty five seventy from Marlin, we've got this forty four from Smith and Wesson, and then we've got uh, you know also on the rimfire side, you know, we've got some action there. So uh, Winchester has uh, entered the fray with a new lever gun, this this Ranger. That's a very inexpensive price point gun it's a it's a really fun gun with buckhorn sights and everything now as often happens at the gun test you know we are pretty rough on stuff we're hard we've had Uh oh i feel like i know where this is going yeah no we we, we've we've uh had some feeding issues with the with that winchester you know and 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 again making guns is hard you know this is this is not unusual so you know that that gun you know it's not functioning extremely well right now we put a lot of rounds through it and it's um you know kind of uh not not working great so we're pulling it from the test and you know we will uh you know give winchester a chance to kind of address that and and you know gussy it up and we'll take a closer look at it when we get a sample that runs reliably but uh you know so the rimfire side we've got um lever actions we have an interesting one from Kiapa as well a takedown 1892 replica that um you know is is you know kind of a, a good a good expression of the gun it's got a, it's got a couple little features on it that 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 could use a little improvement it's a little rough and sharp see whereas like the Smith and Wesson beautifully radius very comfortable to load comfortable to run Mm-hmm. Right. And it actually has the nicest lever gun trigger, like traditional lever gun trigger I've ever felt on a basic production rifle, hmm. actually. 
you know, wow. so Smith really has done quite well. The um, Chiapa has a little bit more pluses and minuses with it. And we ran the hell out of them this afternoon while you weren't looking. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's, in it's, the Chiapa is not, is not threaded and it's, you know, it's a stainless. It's their Alaska 1892 Alaskan takedown. So like Matt was mentioning, these guys making takedown like Bill West, there was a guy, Ken Corcoran in Fairbanks gunsmith, who I think made a night, a much a nicer version than Bill's takedown. Um, you know, you'd buy, buy your, 1895 and take it to him and he'd tear it apart and turn it into a takedown. Um, and he would, he was building those rifles on a much smaller level, but so this 44 mag takedown and I don't know, I've seen a no, I mean, well, one of the Marlin re- reintroduced those at the 1894 last year in 44 mag. Mm-hmm. And you know, I mean, being everyone gravitates towards the 4570 for bear defense type things, but, you know, a 44 mag in a rifle, especially if you, you know, you're picking the right kind of projectile, like it's low recoil, carries a lot of bullets yeah, and is like pretty substantial, much more substantial out of a little carbine lever gun than it is out of a revolver. Sure. So I, I think that's pretty interesting too. The Chiapa was initially, I was not, you know, when we're doing our accuracy testing sharp, like shooting it, you know, we're shooting these things standing braced, you know, on a bagged tripod at 50 yards and uh it was not a lot of fun to run like that but after i started um offhand shooting it like really being able to cycle the action hard i kind of i started really liking that gun we'll be right back after the break in the great outdoors every detail matters That's why Brownells offers you, our Outdoor Life listeners, an exclusive 10% discount with code OL10 to get the gear you need to make the most of your outdoor experience. Whether you're hunting, sighting in your rifle, or just plinking on the back 40, Brownells has the products to help you get the most out of every day outside. So, for a limited time, unlock that exclusive 10% discount on your order with code OL10. That's OL10 at brownells.com. How about Henry by my guys from Wisconsin, Rice Lake? Oh, what, what did, do they have anything in the test this year? Yeah. So, you know, we have, you know, kind of last year, so we've doing new rifles, new handguns, and we're taking a look at kind of a special look at the rimfire category. So we've got a number of rim fires in there that are, that have been around for a little bit. And so we've got this, this Henry, um, small game gun with octagonal barrel and a little peep sight on it. And like all of those Henry's, it just runs like a dream. My God, I just nice guns, <laughs> nice, nice guns. I just, yeah. you, you just want to, you know, yeah. t- you know, take it into, you know, a stand of hardwoods and, you know, start plinking away at bushy tails. And yeah, no, it's so, so that the Henry not surprisingly is, is running pretty sweet. So we've got a nice mix. We've got a nice mix, and and it really shows kind of the versatility of of the lever gun platform, sort of, and you know, and its appeal extends to to people in all these different um, kind of end user groups. It's, it's just fascinating to me because, again, if I had been forced to guess as a kid when I was first hauling one around, I never would have. I didn't have the imagination. Yeah. In terms of what are we talking about in terms of accuracy? You know, someone listening to this and, you know, kind of having their eyebrow uh, perked up a little bit and some of these rifles like, um, you know, what are what can a, a perspective or potential uh, lever action rifle buyer expect from their uh, hunting rifle in terms of accuracy based on this field? pretty some we've had some pretty impressive results you know one thing and you know th- there's a lot obviously we went into depth about the sort of the sbl story and the marlin story you know the the development of that lever evolution and that flex tip bullet you know that that allowed these sort of spitzer style bullets flatter shooting bullets to be loaded safely in a tubular magazine you know part of what uh marlin did with that xlr series of guns this longer barrel is they they tweaked a couple things in terms of how the magazine tube hung under the barrel and and things like that that really helped 
improve the the accuracy of the of the guns and honestly i haven't taken a closer look at the at the marlin dark here but presumably some of that dna is carried forward because we have had some you know particularly with a couple groups in that 4570 what, what like tyler the 300 well, yeah well the barns this afternoon i was i shot maybe six or seven groups five shot groups standing off a bagged tripod at 50 yards with uh 300 grain barns triple shocks and that thing was just not hole after not hole after not hole. I mean, they're cutting big holes, yeah. You know, and I and I like I haven't seen the final tally of what all that and compiled. You know that to see like what all those twenty shots did. But I mean, every group was just a big hole, yeah. <laughs> Which is impressive, yeah. just given the, the the error. You know, standing yeah. off a tripod oh, shooting a I mean, lever gun. I had, so. I had great results from the the Hornady lever evolution stuff. I mean, it's it's shooting really well. Yeah, is it? It's like. um Maybe the the right way to measure these because th- like they're not meant to be precision rifles that we're shooting at like no. three hundred yards. But maybe the way to gauge the accuracy is just like whether you're happy or not. You know, after you're shooting your group, just like oh yeah, that that is about what I felt like I should be shooting with that. Well, I mean, the way I would like, I mean, I think we could get a little more specific than that because. You know, I think the accuracy that we're seeing, the practical accuracy, you know, from a standing supported position and so forth, I think it is equal to anything that the bullet is capable of doing terminally effectively at whatever range you want to shoot it. Oh, okay. You know, yeah. so so what what I would, you know, so you're going to run out of terminal bullet performance before you run out of precision with some of these. Yeah. Is, is my, if that makes sense. Oh, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's it's really quite good. I mean, we're seeing... Like I said, a lot of these kind of just big bug hole groups, that beautiful like forty five seventy wad cutter, di- yeah, like wad just cutter thing. They just they just put the nicest holes in the targets. Yeah. They're just fun, they're just fun to look at. I mean, it'd be it'd be easy to say that translates to like minute of deer, but that's not the case. I mean, they're yeah. these they're shooting great, and yeah, you wouldn't you wouldn't run out of accuracy before you you know ran out of what you wanted that bullet to do. So, cool. or the ability to hit it because of its trajectory. Yeah. What do you think about the, uh, well, let's just say this, like the, the tactical lever gun. Is, is this like, uh, is this legit? Like, are these, um, are these like practical tools or is this just like a fun kind of side market that, you know, it's cool to be able to put accessories on your lever gun and it's just like kind of a, a quirky thing. Yes. I think there are two answers to that question. Yeah. You know, one is that it's it's a fun platform that people just enjoy, and they enjoy it sort of in all these different ways, from the rim fires up to the big kind of bear defense kind of thing. And so there is um, sort of a tinker's appeal to the platform in terms of accessorizing and hanging things on, which is it's kind of its own joy. You know, that said, you know, one of the big advantages of, of lever guns is that they are a, you know, a nice gun. They're not an evil gun, right? You know, they're, so you can own them in. Evil in air quotes. Evil, yeah. <laughs> evil, evil in air quotes. Yeah. No, you, and I think it, they're 50 state legal. Yeah. They're, yeah. So, so it is a gun for somebody that you can have pretty much anywhere around the United States. And, you know, you get one that's tuned up, that has the right accessories. It's an incredibly effective tool. So there is a very practical I think element to it too. So the fun and the practicality. And I think that both those things are giving it a lot of energy. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Matt, you could probably speak to some of the kind of the cooler accessories and sort of things that are. Yeah. It's, it's changed a lot in the last, uh, even just the last couple of years in between hand guards that are available, different butt stocks, you know, quivers for holding cartridges. Um, you know, but it just makes sense. I mean, you know, you think about it, you know, any gun that's used for something other than, traditional deer hunting you know most people want the the option of putting a light on it or just accessorizing like you say people want modularity now right i mean it's no different than you know our most popular firearms ar 1022 1911 you know glock's not so modular but actually that's not even the case anymore and they all share modularity 870 right so you know these accessories have made lever actions modular but it's interesting you pointed about the fun factor I actually took John on a hunt when I was, when I was at Marlin and on all the rider hunts, I would bring, of course, lever actions. We did a lot of hunts, uh, introducing the XL seven bolt action. 
And but I always brought lever actions because you know you've got to have those around as well. And what was interesting, what I noticed as director of marketing and in and, and trying to plug into that fun factor was anytime there was downtime during a hunt, the riders would grab every bit of ammo I brought, grab the lever actions, and go out to whatever ramshackle range the guide had set up to zero the guns and blow through the ammo. Just just like we did today, shooting lever guns for fun, shooting rocks, steel targets, or whatever. Whoa, 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 whoa. Alex wasn't there. <laughs> Our boss wasn't there. It was work. <laughs> yeah. This is true. This yeah, is true. It was, it was, it was, it was, scient- it was, sci- it was scientific. It was scientific. Uh, <laughs> it was, it was getting a feel for the guns. We uh, have to test the fun that's, factor too. That's right. But, <laughs> oh, oh but, a rock. But, but they would never do that with the bolt actions. Bolt actions are great. They're, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're fun to shoot and they're great for, for, for what they're for. But you just don't go out and just sit there and, you know, offhand run rounds through one like you do a lever action it kind of has that you know visceral appeal as you rack the lever forward and backward to chamber the round so i think that combined now with a degree of practicality with the accessories that are available is in fact like john said is what's creating that energy around the entire category well i I, and i also think that if there's one thing that everybody hates it's a it's a lever action rifle with ammunition in it yeah, <laughs> and they and people and people will do anything at a moment's notice to, to, fix, to fix that to, problem. To, to fix that problem, it's, it's incumbent upon you. I mean, the other so that's you know one side driving the driving the market for sure. But then the other one, obviously, is the um, you know the popularity and growing straight wall hunting cartridges, and uh, you know all of these midwestern states and uh, many states in the east allowing straight wall rifles into areas that traditionally were shotgun only zones. So John, you've, you know, you've shot the, you know, most recently the 360 buck hammer, which I actually, my dad lives in Southeastern Wisconsin in like, a, you know, a semi rural, semi suburban area, but he's got a little 30 acre farm that, you know, he can hunt on. And uh, I got him a, Henry rifle in 360 buck hammer for his 60th birthday. Cause um, you know, in part because of your review, but also because it was like, you know, just a really practical option for him. You know, he's never going to at his place, he's never going to shoot beyond a hundred yards. Um, he doesn't want his bullet to travel much beyond that anyway. So that combined with like, this is actually just a nice, beautiful rifle to give my dad. It's like, yeah, I, I wanted to get him a gun and I went through all these different ideas and settled on that because it hit that, um, you know, it hit the nostalgia, but then it also hit this like practical standard because I want him to be able to shoot it and hunt with it, you know? I, I mean, it is a great, it's a, it's a, it's a lovely little cartridge. I mean, it kind of hurts my heart a little bit because my, you know, going back to my original Marlin was a 35 Remington. Yeah. And I just love that round. It's just, you know, that, you know, 200 grain soft point you know, bullet. I mean, I don't know how many animals that has put face first into the, into the leaves in the woods in, over the years, but it's done a lot for me. And I just love that. So the 360 buck hammer, you know, is, is, is a different version. You know, it's, it's the straight wall as opposed to a little bit of a bottom that could actually outperforms, I guess, in that sense, the 35 Remington. But what it does do is it uses that same classic 358 caliber kind of deadliest mushroom in the woods you know bullet i mean that bullet has a great legacy and so yeah from a practical standpoint and now you get to have a a gun that is is really pretty because or or, you know just a you know just a nicer thing to own versus some of the earlier straight wall guns were kind of like cheaper single shot break actions and nothing nothing wrong with that but they don't have the same appeal right as as this so yeah i mean it really you know, and I try to keep tabs on the trends and, and everything. And when the 350 Legend came out, I was like, oh, yeah, that's kind of interesting. But me being out in Montana, I'm like, oh, that's cute for yeah. whoever needs that. And that, meanwhile, meanwhile, all of Ohio was like, finally. <laughs> yes, exactly. I kinda, which I mean, is, which <laughs> it's funny because ironically, like I'm I'm in Alaska, even more removed from any need for that cartridge. And I ended up getting like to do all the testing for our team for that cartridge. (laughs) So I've shot a lot of 350 legend stuff. And pretty impressive. It's it like shockingly accurate. Now, like that's kind of outside the lever gun because it's got like the recessed rebated rim. So it's not, 
uh, different. The, the buck hammer is what is needed for the lever gun. Right. But we also can't forget the, the dirty 30 either. The old 30, 30. Yeah, the old 30. Oh, yeah. yeah, but no, but the, but the, the point is, is that there's been these, these, the, you know, this, these cartridges have been developed to, for, you know, people in those areas. And, you know, they really were craving it in a way where I didn't, you know, I kind of missed the boat on the legend a little bit. Like it, it sort of took me by surprise. And then, so when the buck hammer was announced, I'm like, I'm not going to make that mistake. Again. Yeah. And I took a deeper dive on it and came away pretty, pretty impressed. And I'm like, yeah, I think this thing has legs. Yeah. All right. So we're here. We're in this nice little moment. We've got all these lever guns are shooting good. Where do you see this going in the future? Like what, where, what's kind of the, the five year, 10 year trajectory for, for lever guns? Because man, like so, so many other parts of like the shooting uh, world that we live in are just like hyper accuracy, long range, like better terminal ballistics, like trying to like better, faster, more accurate everything. And like, how does the lever gun market kind of stay relevant or keep enjoying this popularity that it seemingly has in the moment? Yeah, no, I, I think that's a, that's a great question. And, you know, to me, you know, I think one of the things that we have seen in a, in a lot of different ways is that there are certain kind of subcultures and niches in the, in the gun world and in the shooting world that are pretty price insensitive. You know, you look at the amount of money people drop on night vision gear. You look at the amount of money people will put into custom, you know, 2011 pistols or in the precision rifle world and the competitive world. I mean, the the price tags associated with these pursuits are really intense. And, and a lot of people, just because they love that pursuit so much, are willing to, you know, cough up that kind of money. I see that same impulse existing in the lever gun market for the people who want to nerd out and take a deep dive. So I think that for people who come up with ideas and innovations, whether it's lever guns off an AR platform or lever guns that feed a different way or have different things, I think that there's going to be an acceptance of those types of innovations and experiments. They're not all going to take but I think that in terms of a kind of a tinkerer's perspective and an innovation perspective, I don't think we've seen peak lever gun yet. Oh, fun. Yeah. I mean, I mean, not, not at all. I don't know. I mean, what, you know, Matt, you're pretty close to that. I mean, what do you, what do you think? Am I, am I wrong? Am I right? No, I, I agree with all that. I think, I think that it's not going to just be for the price and sensitive crowd as well. And I think manufacturers, I mean, they, you know, they love to fill a void of, of demand. Right. So. You know, I think, you know, Ruger, for instance, probably will strive to get the cost down. I mean, there isn't any way they wouldn't want to produce a lever action at a price that sold, you know, the volume like Marlin used to. And they might, they might be already, but they know there's demand there for more. And I think that the 4570 has been around, I mean, since uh, late 1800s, right? And it's ebb and flow, but it doesn't go away. And I think when somebody, lever actions have now finally kept up with, the trends in styling, accessorizing, that sort of thing. I think that was the thing that was missing for lever action rifles. You said lever action, you thought Woodstock 3030 for the most part. That's not what the market wants for the most part. There still is, of course. But the fact that manufacturers have brought those guns into the modern realm, I think they'll keep doing it. I think they'll keep improving the designs, improving the function. Like like the dark with the uh, polymer stock. You know, that was actually one of the most common requests we had at Marlin. We couldn't do it, but that was a very common request. That has nothing to do with nostalgia. They still wanted a working tool that had the functionality of a lever action, which is, you know, it points well, it's rapid firing, um, and it's fun. So a lot of time we forget about the fun factor involved with a firearm that we get so caught up in performance that sometimes it's nice to just go out and have a good time shooting it. So I think it's just going to continue along that trend, and I think they're not not going anywhere. Yeah, I mean, talking to the the Marlin the Marlin Ruger folks, um, like some of their challenge is just getting enough of these guns made because the demand for them is so high. So if that's any indication, um, that's a good sign for things to come. Certainly. Well, and they have an interesting situation in that. I mean, in talking with them, 
they have incredible demand for the classic stuff. Hmm. Yeah. And they're getting beat up for not having enough, you know, blued steel walnut stock models. Yeah. They're also getting hammered for not producing enough SBLs, trappers, and the new, the 1894 you were talking about, the yeah. 44 mag. That's one of the dark introductions going to be in the Marlin dark series. And they already know there's no way they're going to be able to make enough of those. Yeah. So kind of interesting, two very different markets that are, you know, scrambling for something, you know, beating them up over something that they have to respond to, or they of course want to respond to. So, and you want to talk about fun shooting one of those like 44, 44 specials with a suppressor on it. Like it's pretty cool. Oh yeah. <laughs> and that's maybe the best example of how like the, uh, the old school lever gun is meeting the new, you know, meeting the new world. You're shooting almost all these guns suppressed whenever and, possible. And whenever possible. And, and that's, you know, and look, let's go back. I mean, what are the things that are common to everybody's experience with a lever gun? They handle well, they're short, they're short barreled, you know, they're, they're quick to bring into play and stuff. We have the ability now to mount lots of optics on them. And, and you look at the popularity of optics that are designed for not long range shooting, you know, things like the LPVOs and reflex sites and so forth. All of these things tie right into the historic configuration of a lever gun. Yeah. You know, I mean, they all play in perfectly. Yeah. And the, and the suppressor is kind of like the icing on the cake. You know, we've been talking about sort of our ideal situation. You know, Tyler obviously lives up in bear country. I, I spend a lot of time in bear countries as well. And so it's, it's not a, um, uh, just sort of a theoretical consideration for us. I have to say, when you end up shooting a bear very close range in the woods, it is loud. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so, and so, it's have, practical to. It's, it's, it's not just to have fun, a can a can on yeah. these things, you know. So it's you know, and also it makes it cool, and it just improves the the experience of shooting it, and especially some of these like flow through designs. You know, you can really kind of feel the difference in the recoil impulse and in terms of fine tuning the performance of it. So, yeah, I think all of these things are pointing to a continued energy innovation and interest in lever guns. Nice. All right. Well, we have to get back to work uh, because the next podcast has to cover everything else. <laughs> Thanks, guys. The Outdoor Life Podcast is edited by Mike Peterson of 85 Audio. It's hosted by me, Editor-in-Chief Alex Robinson. It's usually produced by our senior editor, Natalie Krebs, but this week she's off in Australia doing some hunting and reporting for a future podcast. The music in this episode was composed by Pierre Locatelli via APM Music.